एक्टिविटी का ट्वेल्थ Good afternoon, dear guests, speakers, and audience. It is a great pleasure to meet you all here. I'm Cheryl, research analyst from Leader Associates, and I hope we'll have a meaningful two hours in this live room today. Well, when you have technical questions, please leave a comment in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, and our colleagues will assist. And when you have a topic related question, please feel free to use the Q&A function so our speakers can see your questions and answer it. Well, our event is in partnership with Solar PV Show 2022 and ASEAN Clean Energy Week 2022. Solar PV Show is a major exhibition for information and business exchange between multiple stakeholders in the Vietnam PV value chain, including government, investors, developers, suppliers, well, and general contractors and key equipment manufacturers. ASEAN Clean Energy Week is one of the most influential and attractive solar conference and exhibitions in Southeast Asia, focusing on gathering senior energy experts and decision makers from the regional government and the fields of power, technology, finance, business, and others to discuss solar per storage, CNI project, grid management, floating solar, and other key concepts. Well, we welcome you to meet us in Vietnam and Philippines in October and November this year. With a growing emphasis on energy transition in Southeast Asia, more and more renewable energy projects are coming to fruition here. And now, hydrogen energy is a focus of a new round of discussions. Considering the storage function, value, and energy security meanings of hydrogen, it seems to be an option with many advantages. But the issues of cost, investment, manpower, infrastructure are all real. So today I have invited several guests to share with us the role of green hydrogen in Southeast Asia's energy transition, the so ways and problems of implementation and the business models in practice. And finally, power companies, developers, financiers, and technical consulting firms will discuss their views, decisions, and solutions specifically. Well, first, let's welcome Dr. Roland Rush, Deputy Director Innovation Technology Center, Arena to present the topic, Green Hydrogen for Southeast Asia's Clean Energy Transformation. Let's welcome him. Uh, yes, good, good morning. Uh, my name is Roland Rösch. I'm Deputy Director of the Innovation and Technology Center of IRENA. And I just tried to, to share my, my slide deck. One moment. Uh, yes, I think you can see my slides now. Um, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, is a governmental organization with, with 165 member countries. We have the mandate to support in those member countries the global energy transition. And IRENA is uh, kind of really working on this energy transition of which uh, hydrogen, especially green hydrogen, uh, pl uh, plays an important role. So I'm pleased to have the presentation today about the possibility of green hydrogen economy in the ASEAN's power and utility sector. So green hydrogen for Southeast Asia, clean energy transformation. Um, it's, I would like to say that I have some, some generic slides to explain the situation and the possibilities that are offered by uh, the, the, green, the, the green hydrogen economy. And then I have some, some very latest uh, slides of the, the G20 presidency of Indonesia where we had an investment forum, where we presented some insights in and possibilities of the power sector transformation in the ASEAN region, which will provide you a lot of insights. 
uh, as for as first slide, I would like to make the point here that um, the, the costs of renewable energies have come down significantly in the past 10 years. So solar photovoltaics by 82%, concentrating solar power by 47, onshore wind by 39% and offshore wind by 29%, but also hydropower uh, costs are, are, are very low. It's very important to make the point here that these renewable energies are competitive. They are more, uh, more uh, the costs are lower as for fossil fuels and for nuclear, which of course offers a lot of business opportunity. And there you see, uh, let's say that uh, the, the possibility to use hydrogen as a clean energy carrier is a possibility to, um, to produce cheap renewable energy and then to trade it as uh, with hydrogen as an energy carrier. Hydrogen is a compromise solution for the renewable industry and the gas industry. Hydrogen can be used in, in uh, gas infrastructure and it is essential for the energy transition. It opens interesting transition pathways also for, to for today's oil and as gas exporting countries, which explore also the possibility to, to export uh, hydrogen, blue hydrogen or purple hydrogen. Falling renewable electricity costs make green hydrogen also a feasible solution that is needed for the energy transition. If you look here, the world has to reduce um, to achieve um, net zero and to stabilize the climate on a 1.5 degrees pathway, the world has to reduce the carbon uh, emissions by 36.9 gigatons per year. And the most of the, the opportunities here to reduce those emissions come from uh, direct uh, power and direct uses of renewables. It comes from energy conservation and energy efficiency measures by 25%. Also the, the electrification in the end use sector. So to use more electricity in some sectors where you currently use fossil fuels will reduce um, the CO2 footprint by another 20%. The important figure is here. So to, to achieve the, this decarbonization, 10% hydrogen and its derivates is needed in several sectors. I will go into the details. But first, I would like to make the point here. So looking at, um, and, and there's always a discussion, how competitive is green hydrogen uh, production? And there it is very important to say there is two factors that are very important to produce competitively uh, competitive to fossil fuel produced hydrogen um, and the two drivers are the electrolyzer capex and it is of course the the, the costs of the electricity the renewable electricity that you use and you see here in this graph uh, let's say two uh, two curves. One curve is with high, with electrolyzer costs starting at 1,000 kilowatt on the upper end, on the 600 kilowatt on the lower end. And you see here, let's say if the electricity the price is um, in a in a higher range, uh, then you will not be competitive. But in areas where the renewable energy costs are, and, and in some places you have it for solar uh, with 2.5 US dollar cent per kilowatt hour, um, up to also four um, US dollar um, for produced generated green electricity for wind. In such a range, we will see with this very low costs for renewable electricity, we will see a very strong competitiveness of green hydrogen also by 2030 here, depending 
on the, uh, the CAPEX for the electrolyzers, which is of course very much dependent on the learning costs of the innovation and of the level of scale. And I can tell you the level of scale to produce hydrogen is already extremely high. But still, I think 95% uh, of um, the hydrogen is produced at the moment based on fossil fuels, which is used in refineries. And just this, this fossil fuel based production of blue hydrogen creates a CO2 emissions, which are in the range of the emissions that a country like Indonesia, for, for instance, has. So it is very important to make this transition to produce hydrogen on the basis of renewable energies, which will help to reduce the carbon footprint and which will open the opportunities that green hydrogen can offer. And <clears throat> you see here, let's say looking into the electricity value chain, you can use uh, the green hydrogen to decarbonize the transport. Very important is here to mention that there are railways, there is heavy trucks, there is aviation and there is shipping. And specifically for aviation and shipping, there is no other opportunity as using green hydrogen or synthetic fuels coming from uh, renewable energies. The, in the industry sector, also very important, there is no other way as making carbon-free steel or carbon-free chemicals as using uh, green hydrogen as a feedstock to produce those, um, those uh, carbon-free steel and chemicals. Uh, other way, you can of course trade the hydrogen then as, 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 uh, as liquid hydrogen, or you can use the derivates like methanol or more likely ammonia to transport and to use it then in the value chain. Also the decarbonization of the current gas grids uh, there is an opportunity also with methanization to use then the green uh, gas uh, produced from green hydrogen in the existing pipeline structure and uh, yeah, use it there also in, in fuel cells for the production of heat and power. Of course, we, we have to say that the, the as you have seen in the earlier chart, <clears throat> the dominant road uh, for the, 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 the um, reduction of CO2 emissions in the end use sector will be electrification. But in, a, in the later stage, let's say from 2030 onwards, the energy transition will only be uh, possible if we use 10% uh, hydrogen in the systems to decarbonize uh, chemical production, steel production, and also the, the transport opportunities are only to be carbonized, uh, decarbonized by using green hydrogen, which makes the avenue in producing in the longer term green hydrogen an avenue which is necessary. Otherwise, we will not be able to achieve the energy transition and stabilize the climate on 1.5 degrees. But this is a political message. It is already clear that a lot of private sector companies see the possibilities that there is a business related to the green hydrogen production and trading and IRENA is strongly working on this. I would like to go some, to some aspects of um, information we prepared as IRENA on behalf of the G presidency of Indonesia, which gives some insights. So the economic and population growth will result in a 2.5 fold increase in energy demand by 2015 in the ASEAN region. Indonesia is the largest energy consumer in, in the ASEAN and crucial for supporting the region's transition to cleaner energy. ASEAN still depends heavily on fossil fuels. Around 86% of primary energy demand in 2021 was produced with uh, fossil fuels. The region has sufficient supply of fossil fuels, has insufficient supply. So that means for the longer term, there is not uh, sufficient fossil fuel for current demand and widening the gap into the future. So there is a, 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 a import dependence 
is growing also in the ASEAN region. A new port push on global level to reach net zero emissions around mid-century and some ASEAN countries have already pledged to achieve net zero emissions. So <clears throat> some countries in the ASEAN region also have the objective to achieve net zero. Renewables have hit historic lows in terms of cost. So this um, kind of cost advantage in the ASEAN region still has a huge potential. Uh, ASEAN has a significant untaped renewable energy potential and IRENA sees more use of this uh, renewable energy potential in the future. If you want to look uh, at the more details, then you can find uh, on the IRENA webpage three reports which are related to the ASEAN re region, which is the renewables outlook for ASEAN towards regional energy transition. And then you find also an energy transition outlook for in Indonesia and for Malaysia, which are specific reports. <clears throat> if you look here as, at the demand growth and the energy mix of 2050, then IRENA's 1.5 uh, degrees scenario will see a big push towards electrification, renewables and energy efficiency, which will reduce the energy demand by 22% compared to the originally planned energy scenario in the region. Electricity will compromise 45% of the total final consumption in the 1.5 degrees scenario compared to the below 20% today. Hydrogen will play a role in this. So there will be a possibility to play in hydrogen. So hydrogen will play a role, especially in the industry sector and in international bunkering. And depending on how fast the renewable energy potential can be um, exploited in Indonesia. We see also potential for trading of green hydrogen in the far future. The renewable direct use will grow, namely bioenergy, but fossil fuels will still be consumed in the regions. <clears throat> Investments in energy efficiency make up around one third of investment with an um, energy efficiency rate increasing from 1.1% per year to 2.5% per year. So what needs to happen to, let's say, if, un, under these preconditions, what needs to happen that is, uh, that is um, uh, potential and the green hydrogen trading and the business can start? I think it is very important that national hydrogen strategies in the region will be defined in many other regions in the world, like in Latin America, in Europe, uh, the most country have already defined national hydrogen strategies. In ASEAN, this is only starting now. Um, it is a governance system and enabling policies are necessary to define the rules, also to make sure that the ASEAN region is part of the international trading of green hydrogen to comply with certification and standardization of other regions. So a governance system and enabling policies have to be defined. Very important is guarantees of origin because you need to make sure that blue hydrogen stays blue hydrogen based on the fossil fuel production and that green hydrogen from green hydrogen production really comes from renewable sources and that the use of renewable sources in green hydrogen will not produce fossil fuel based CO2 emission in other areas of the energy system. And then of course, it is very important to establish policy priorities in the different region that are linked to other, other regions. This is a thing you can find in our green hydrogen policy guide, which is a very important information for policymakers. Also, IRENA is offering for its membership, the member countries, a collaborative framework on green hydrogen. The collaborative framework on green hydrogen is discussing with the IRENA membership about 70 members there we, we are discussing the opportunity to establish a working a green hydrogen market with international trading and the framework 
that is given the framework and regulation for an international trading of green hydrogen, which is essential. I would like to summarize here, green hydrogen is part of the energy transition. It helps to integrate more solar and wind. So you need hydrogen also for the integration of solar and wind. It is essential for the decarbonization, especially of the end use sector as it plains, and it helps to tap into remote renewable energy potential because you have other ways of transporting uh, renewable energies as with uh, wires and cables and transmission lines. You can use green hydrogen as a carrier and carrying it in, in its derivates as methanol and ammonia. Also, global hydrogen trade can enhance the energy security. It is likely that green ammonia and other hydrogen commodity trade will grow faster than the trade of liquid hydrogen trade. Important is also the infrastructure development, building up the market and to have standardization and certification system in place. With this enabling frameworks, which are crucial to facilitate the green hydrogen ramp up also in the ASEAN region. The key points for ASEAN, the ASEAN region over the next three decades will see total final energy consumption almost triple, electricity demand increase up to five times, energy greenhouse gas emission double, all while indigenous domestic fuel supply is shrinking, import and dependency is rising. The renewable energy increases to 26% of primary energy in 2030, up from 30% today. Longer term to 2050, the renewable energy share will rise to over two thirds of energy demand, cutting energy related CO2 emissions by 75% compared to the, uh, the, the planned energy to the scenario in 2050 or less than half compared of today. Key investment opportunities in the region include renewable power transmission, biofuels, hydrogen, and electromobility. ASEAN solar increases to 241 gigawatt and the total renewable power capacity to 370 gigawatt in the IRENA 1.5 scenario by 2030. Total renewable capacity addition to 2030 are 303 gigawatts. A significant opportunity exists to produce clean energy and green commodities for clean energy technology manufacturing in the region. Here I would like to, to stop my presentation and uh, check out uh, the reports we have of the region on of green hydrogen and I give back uh, to Cheryl. Thanks a lot for having me here. It was a pleasure talking here, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Roland. Well, I only have one question for you. You mentioned Indonesia and then Malaysia, but how do you think about Vietnam? Since Vietnam has abundant photovoltaic and wind projects now, it seems to have great potential for green hydrogen. Yes, of course, uh, I, Irina, uh, Vietnam is unfortunately not an IRENA member yet. It's actually one of the, the, I think there's not other country in the ASEAN region that is not an IRENA member. But of course, we are working also closely in the ASEAN context with Vietnam, and we see a huge potential for renewable energies in Vietnam, mm -hmm. mainly uh, onshore wind and offshore wind create big, big opportunities and uh, also the, the, the government and uh, the private sector is in Vietnam is very agile and is part of the journey there exploring the opportunities to, to increase the, product, the generation of renewable energy. So we see a huge potential there also in technology development. Vietnam is, is very active and is an extremely innovative country in adapting the technologies to its specific requirements. And I'm sure, um, let's say green hydrogen production is not on top of things at the moment in Vietnam, but with an increased share of renewable energies, 
and with uh, um, increasing opportunities, I, I expect also that there will be big engagements coming from, from Vietnam. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the answering and also for your presentation and wish you a nice day today. And well, next, let's listen to the SMP Global's experts' insights on the pathway and challenges of decarbonizing the ASEAN power sector with hydrogen and ammonia. Let's welcome Mr. Lee. Hi, can everyone see my screen here? Yes, we okay. can see it. Great. Um, so I, I, I'm actually from uh, S&P Global Commodity Insights. So it's essentially the merged entity of S&P Plats as well as uh, IHS Market. And today I'm actually presenting to you quite a quick summary on decarbonizing ASEAN power sector um, and how hydrogen and ammonia can be utilized and what are the pathways and challenges behind it. But really as a beginning, how do we paint the backdrop around it? Why, why is it required? So if we actually see Southeast Asia as a whole, Southeast Asia's power demand growth has averaged quite an impressive, close to 6% annually over the past decade. It's really one of the fastest growing uh, regions in the world. And if you were to actually compare that to how the global uh, power demand growth has grown, the global demand growth is somewhere around 2.5%. So it's less than half of what Southeast Asia has grown at. Historically, power demand growth has outpaced GDP growth in the region because um, largely the region as a whole, uh, electricity intensity was really high. However, as governments increasingly take a stronger stance towards energy efficiency as an effort to reach net zero, it's expected to slowly decline over time. Um, going forward, the region still has really, really good economic fundamentals. It's really a low cost production area still. And therefore, the trajectory of growth will still be strong. Commercial industrial sector will be driving power demand growth uh, due to the general expansion of the sector, changes in subsector compositions, as well as electrification of commercial and industrial spaces. Electrification of spaces and processes will involve things like commercial buildings, uh, adopting more electrical appliances such as air conditioning, uh, more digitalizing of services, as well as industrial processes increasingly being electrified and automated, exposed to, as opposed to relying on manual labor as labor cost increases over time. Um, so the adoption of electric city um, equipment instead of fossil fuel equipment will definitely be one of the uh, areas that will continue to push the growth. So in terms of strong economic growth fundamental, we expect uh, power demand growth to still be at least 5% per annum over the next two decades, and then slow down gradually, probably from 2030 to 2040s. But then, so how is this power demand growth going to be filled in the region? Um, the chart on the right there is essentially our base case um, forecast in terms of the uh, power capacity outlooks. So renewables like solar and wind will definitely be taking up a large share of the capacity additions. Um, largely owing to the declining costs, as well as the ambitious renewable targets um, across the region. I think uh, Dr. Roland did mention earlier that really renewable costs are really at all-time historical lows. However, um, given that there's still going to be a lot of base load demand and things like that, it's quite tough for an intermittent renewable source to be competing against that or to have sufficient capacity um, coupled with batteries and have a cost advantage over uh, thermal generation. So over, over the next two decades or so, we still expect a sizable amount of thermal generation. However, I um, think as the chart clearly shows, solar and wind capacity, it's going to go up by like somewhat like tenfold over the next two decades, while thermal generation still grows to just under threefolds. So it's, what is clear here is that thermal generation, coal and gas, are still here to stay at least in the next 20 years or so. So where does this actually bring us? Even as renewable growth outpaces thermal generation, the grid emission factor, which is essentially the carbon emission uh, per kilowatt hour or per megawatt hour is expected to decline, largely because there's going to be more renewable generation. However, um, in terms of the entire power sector carbon emission, it is still expected to increase, largely because thermal generation, uh, thermal capacity is going to increase over the next two decades. This is even despite a reduction in coal-fired capacity, which is currently in most of the country's power development plans. 
we expect coal-fired power carbon emissions to peak by 2030s and then decline thereafter. However, uh, what somewhat backfills some of this coal-fired capacity will definitely be additional gas-fired capacity that comes uh, in. So part of the retirements of coal capacity will be made up by gas-fired capacity as well as renewables. So how does this actually look like if we have to compare it? versus how emissions look like um, back in 2019. So on the chart on the right, that's essentially our forecast where the power sector emissions will look like by 2040. Um, it is pretty clear, at least based on government announcements, government plans, as well as our forecast, that I think only three countries will see a reduction in um, emissions, uh, which are namely Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. So Singapore's, in Singapore's case, they are trying to um, increase the amount of clean power imports and things like that. While Malaysia, they want to do the retirement of um, coal capacity as when the PPAs are up. Thailand, on the other hand, also wants to phase out their coal capacity. While for most of the other countries in the region, which are actually the larger, uh, the countries with a larger coal-fired power fleet, um, it's the emissions are still likely to continue growing owing to really the continued reliance on coal. Um, relatively slow retirement because the coal fleet is still relatively young as well as the increase in gas fired capacity. So against this backdrop, given the continued importance, I would say, of thermal generation, at least for the next two to three decades, what then can be done um, to reduce the emissions from this thermal generation? And that essentially brings us to the crux of this presentation. So there are actually several options currently available to reduce emissions from thermal generation. And for a couple of them, there are already certain studies, certain demonstration projects already successfully implemented globally. So I'll just start from the top. So first and foremost, definitely will be coal firing of biomass together with coal. This has already been explored by Indonesia, where Indonesia's PLN has been aggressively seeking biomass coal firing solutions and has already tested coal firing in different types of coal, bo coal boilers with different biomass types and blending shares. And by the end of 2021, there are really six plants in commercialization phase. And another 52 coal plants, totally at 18 gigawatts, that are planned to use biomass coal firing by 2024. And following the successful trial, I would say, of 5% uh, biomass coal blending, uh, Indonesia is actually gradually wanting to increase the blending ratio up 20%. And by 2030, um, they want to try to uh, apply this 20% blending across all major coal plants. Moving on to the next option on the right, of course, is carbon capture and storage. Um, I would say it's still relatively nascent in the use for power sector. I think Dr. Roland did mention this as well. So based on our internal um, database, around only about 4% of operating carbon capture and storage projects are being utilized for the coal and gas power plants. Um, going forward, um, we, we do track that there's still around 30% of close to 200 million tons per annum of captured carbon capture projects that are in various stages of development that will be in the power sector, but the bulk of the application still goes into industrial processes, largely because the concentration of CO2 is significantly higher in many of those other processes, which essentially translate to a lower cost to capture per ton of CO2. So that brings us essentially to two of the, I would say, clean fuel, cleaner fuel sources, so hydrogen as a fuel. So I'd say most recently, uh, MHI, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, they did report successful testing of a 20% hydrogen blend uh, in the US for a gas plant. And this follows on from earlier um, testing of, by GE of a 5% uh, blending for CCGT. Um, if we take, to take it in the context of Southeast Asia, there are quite a number of latest plant CCGT plantings in the region that are intended to be hydrogen ready. Um, other than that, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, they have all made some mention of adding hydrogen as a fuel uh, for power generation. I think most recently, I think just a couple of weeks ago, we did see uh, capital infrastructure actually make, taking fin final investment decision on a hydrogen-ready uh, CCGT that will be built in Singapore, which is to commission in 2026. So that's definitely a tick for, for the um, use of hydrogen as fuel. Um, last but not least, definitely is ammonia as a fuel. Um, it has been successfully tested. IHI has already successfully tested a 20% ammonia coal blend. And Japan's JARA is essentially moving ahead with IHI to start the 20% blend at their unit 4 of the Hakkinen uh, coal plant in 2023. 
uh, bring it back to the Southeast Asian context, Vietnam's latest PDP-8 draft that was released, I think, back in August, has clearly stated that they intend to do blending for their coal-fired power plants with both biomass and ammonia, and will gradually be switching to use this uh, cleaner fuels uh, on coal plants when the technology is proven safe and economical. PMB in Malaysia has also carried out a test of coal fire with ammonia as some of their test with facilities. So it's quite evident and clear that there are multiple emission reduction options available um, to somewhat reduce the emissions from thermal generation, even as thermal generation remains quite a sizable share of the power mix um, in Southeast Asia. But what are really some of the considerations, major considerations for the utilization of this low carbon fuels? I think first and foremost, definitely like what um, the Roland mentioned earlier, there's a lot of things like standards, uh, industry standards, industry requirements and things like that. Those things really do need to be pinned down and firmed up first because typically if you were to see Southeast Asian countries in general, they tend to be followers in some of these leading cutting edge technologies and not trailblazers. This will, they will really be dependent on whether global hydrogen and ammonia industries are developed, supply chains are established, and lastly, whether there are various international standards in place. Mm. But there are, of course, some other considerations more on the technical part of things. So definitely the questions that needs to be answered in terms of the government planning, as well as the commercial decisions that need to be made. Um, are they intending to be using more on the blending or dedicated use of low carbon fuels? So that's definitely key in their minds because power plants, are they actually ready to be burning blended fuels? It's not just a case of whether the boilers and turbines are actually ready for it and designed for it, but are there plans to actually add things like blending skits and whatnot? If the fuels need to be blended on site, if the transmission network just cannot, um, just cannot accommodate uh, blended fuels in the network itself. So these are additional uh, things that need to be considered. Of course, there's also things such as like, uh, on, will on-site storage be required as well? And like I mentioned earlier, can the net gas networks actually transport blended fuels? And if not, are the governments ready to make a, I would say a relatively big investment decision to actually build a parallel network um, that will need to be developed if the blending rate percentage actually goes beyond a certain amount? Or alternatively, are there intentions to have any other means of transportation here, whether trucking, whether uh, small vessels uh, shipping some of these alternative fuels? And I think there's always one other big consideration here, especially if it's going to go into the network, the gas network is, are all the end users connected to the network, are they all capable of utilizing blended fuels? Because if, if let's say a handful of them or if a sizable amount of them can't actually utilize blended fuels, um, utilizing the existing network is a no-go uh, solution then. Some of the other, I would say, other critical areas that also need to be considered are things like, are all... Uh, are the receiving facilities actually able to accommodate blended fuels or do they actually require additional uh, facilities, receiving terminals and whatnot? And I think last but not least is really the timing of the adoption. This is highly related to the first point in terms of standards, in terms of how developed the supply chain is because every bit of this will then uh, boil down into a cost and who will then be the ones to bear the cost, which is what will take me to essentially my last slide. So broadly, we did some analysis here on really the cost considerations, the trade-off between the cost of electricity versus the cost of abatement itself. So if you have to see the two charts side by side here, um, for the chart on the left, these are essentially just a representative um, levelized cost of electricity for Southeast Asia, looking at thermal generation, uh, coal and gas, as well as adding on CCS, as well as doing some blending of hydrogen. Cost consideration is definitely paramount in the region as many of the countries actually still have subsidized regulated power prices. So there appears to be quite a clear trade-off where from the chart on the left, you can see that blending of hydrogen or ammonia into the fuel does not result in too high an increase in the levelized cost of electricity. So it might be a lower cost option uh, in this aspect. However, if you were to look at the chart on the right in terms of the emission abatement cost, so the dollar per ton uh, abatement cost for um, carbon, you can see it's somewhat a different story where adding CCS actually has a lower dollar per uh, ton abatement cost. 
So this whole decision making will need to be undertaken, I would say, somewhat by the government um, as and when they want to try and put in place carbon pricing, what's their kind of medium term target in terms of how much carbon deductions they want to put in place while weighing against the increase in power prices um, across the board. Yep. So if you're actually interested to actually see some of our other content, you can actually just quite simply scan this QR code and we have a whole range of a whole series of research papers that we have put out in, uh, on energy transition in the Southeast Asia power sector. Thanks, Cheryl, back to you. Yeah. Well, thank you for the sharing and uh, I have one question for you. We always regard ammonia as a transition product for hydrogen, but actually we see that the buyer market for ammonia itself may be bigger than that for hydrogen due to the agriculture and industrial development in Southeast Asia. So do you think maybe in this region, ammonia will have a larger market in the future, not hydrogen? I think based on what we see today in terms of like announced plant projects and things like that, there seems to be a stronger push towards hydrogen, I would say, in terms of, let's say, the plant generation plantings and things like that. I would say more there's more headlines being made on having gas turbines or CCGTs being plant that are hydrogen ready than ammonia ready. In terms of ammonia ready, it's really just a handful of projects, some blending. And I think Singapore's one, there's a latest one that's being co-developed by Jera and whatnot for a 60 megawatt, 100% uh, ammonia project. But you don't really hear as much of the ammonia side of things as compared to burning of hydrogen for power, at least based on the current plans. Well, okay, thank you for the answer. Yeah, no problem, thanks. Yeah. Okay, next. Well, in terms of commercial implementation, ADB has already taken the first step in the renewable energy plus hydrogen projects. And Mr. Stephen Peters, well, tell us about their application and business model for hydrogen production using marine renewables as a reference for other RE types. So let's welcome Mr. Stephen Peters. Thanks, Cheryl. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Look, thank you to the organisers for inviting the Asian Development Bank to this event. And I must apologise, I'm just recovering from COVID, so um, my speaking is not particularly good. Today, I'd like to take a different tack than the earlier two present presenters who presented very good outlines on the technical and commercial side. Um, I'd like to change the thinking frame. And I wanted to look at... Um, to take a look at the hydrogen economy, not as an extension of existing supply chains and existing asset allocations, but to look at it as possibly an opportunity to rethink certain deliveries of business models and use cases. Um, I'll use a great example of the newspapers prior to the uh, implementation of smartphones who thought that they had a business forever, when in fact that smartphones completely changed that dynamic. I think that as we move forward, we will see more device type activities and we will see more different business case uses. Um, so it doesn't mean that we stop doing what we're doing at the moment. And as um, Arena very rightly said, we still have a long way to go on transition. But if you look at the key elements of any hydrogen supply chain, it's gonna be power generation, which is gonna be driven by dollars per kilowatt. That's gonna be the primary consideration. Um, there'll be conversion to hydrogen. What's the cost and what's the capacity? There's also implications for fresh water use. Um, how do we make power to X, the ammonia, the methanol? What are going to be the production methodologies? What are going to be the transport and distribution methodologies? One of the great concerns is obviously transporting ammonia across the sea. If there's an, imp uh, and there's an impact um, as a, a leak or there's uh, a sinking, that's going to be a catast catastrophe. Are there different types of materials we can use? I know that Japan's doing some interesting work on solid state storage, and there's work going on in Europe about the use of pastes that actually allowed, uh, allow for storage and distribution of hydrogen at a wholesale and at a retail level. And then there's the traditional models. We have these traditional point-to-point -point models. We build a big power station, we stick in distribution and we transmit energy around it. 
Um, in some parts of ADB's developing member countries, uh, we don't have distribution. And in fact, the opportunities come for, uh, arrive for the use of batteries and uh, hybrid storage systems. So there are a range of activities that can occur. We think this is gonna happen with hydrogen as well. We think in some remote locations, hydrogen may end up being cheaper as a fuel than fossil fuels shipped to that location. Doesn't mean that the, the international market price these prices will be competitive, but in the particular use case, they will be. And that's, the, I think, the important point to come across. One of the things that's going to be really important about developing the hydrogen economy, regardless of the technical aspects of whether power plants can use them or whether there's uh, distribution, they're all, they're all engineering issues which can get resolved. By the way, I'm an engineer, so I don't speak lightly about it, but they are engineering issues demand is going to be the biggest issue. And how do we create demand and foster demand? I note that Jera had a call for half a million tonnes of ammonia issued, I think in January or February this year. That would make up, that would be called what we call an advanced market commitment, where a large buyer or a large player commits to purchasing materials or particular commodities, which then drive the development of those markets to produce more of it. I can't understate the impact of advanced market commitments. They're tremendously important. But we have this large legacy infrastructure, which is, you know, driven by oil and gas and traditional power infrastructure. You know, it's pipeline related, large commercial emitters like cement and steel, who obviously will be the ones that we should prioritise first, as Irene very quite, quite rightly said, because they're the low hanging fruit. But we also need to look at how we're going to co-locate with existing facilities, how we're going to reduce existing facilities, which my earlier presenters have talked about. Um, the one great strength that we have with existing oil and gas and power infrastructure is an enormous amount of industrial capacity, expertise and access to capital. And so I think the argument about um, green good, blue bad uh, is a little bit fallacious and that we should be looking at how we can drive more to green. But if we're going to have to use blue, what is the particular use case for blue? And we had recently released our energy policy uh, in 2019 uh, and 2020, I think, and sorry, my apologies. And that policy outlined where and when we could look at using um, oil and, uh, uh, natural gas and also blue hydrogen. It's gonna be a lot more difficult than for us perhaps to fund green hydrogen, which is a very big focus for us. But when you look at, um, when you look at rethinking these models, um, I'll use a great example of this. This is a mobile phone. I'm sure all of you have one. Um, 20 years ago, we didn't. I remember the first time I got my mobile phone, it was 1993, and I was one of four or five people in my town that had one. So um, new devices are gonna come on board, new mechanisms for producing and producing uh, hydrogen are gonna come on board as well. And they may, may not be at very large scale. They may be at localized scale where um, uh, solar or wind is used or another form of renewable energy is used and that then goes on to create an excess and that excess can be converted to hydrogen. Now that model might be a very interesting model that we see at a domestic level or at a small settlement level which is a very important area for ADB because a lot of those areas are underserved and traditionally poorer. So um, our concern is um, how do we promote the reduction of uh, emissions? How do we De help decarbonize the environment, the, the, the power and energy sector. And I won't go into the energy transition mechanism, which ADB is working on. I have other colleagues who are working on that, but you can look that up online if you wish to. Um, what I'm more interested in is where are the particular different use cases? And I'll use a great example, marine renewable energy. Now, marine renewable energy, most people think is horrendously expensive. Um, and uh, it's very complicated and it requires significant levels of operations and maintenance cost. Well, we already have examples of people who've been doing it. There's a large project in the Orkneys in the UK, which has been operating for a while, which looks at the, the, that use of energy plus excess for fuel, which I talked about. So there's a lot of data on that and how, how those supply chains work. And we're increasingly seeing more offshore wind and offshore energy being used for production of hydrogen to make um, to service markets in Europe. I note that this particular project that Orsted's doing actually had a change in, in use apparently because of the particular conditions in the Ukraine. So let's just look at ADB's developing member countries that have large exclusive economic zones. And 
just for the moment, just assume that we can make hydrogen for $2 a kilo in those locations. At the moment, we can't. Somewhere it's between $3.50 and about $8, depending on the technology and the location. But let's just assume it's $2 further down the track. That's the amount of market size, if you look at those numbers, for 1% of a country's exclusive economic zone. That's an enormous amount of energy that's available. Now, that's based on just doing floating solar. But if you were to look at doing offshore wind or you were looking at tidal arrays or a range of other activities, depending on the generation cost for electricity, uh, you'd see it's a massive market. And if you, look at, um, if you look at that amount of energy, if we had those countries, which are all ADB developing member countries, if they took 1% of that, we could displace global energy demand. Now, obviously we can't get that to global energy markets, but assume we converted it to hydrogen, that'd displace 40% of current uh, natural gas needs. Now, again, that's pie in the sky. That's a big, big idea, big different idea about where we're gonna be. But actually we're not taking it from an idea to compete with traditional supply chains. We're looking at it as an idea to pr provide energy to those underserved communities and provide development and growth to them and energy security. That's where we're coming from. So um, the model looks something like this. It's probably very different to what everybody else is looking at. Um, using offshore energy opportunities, using electrolysis, obviously we're gonna have to, um, to uh, desalinate water to get it to capacity that, to the level that it can be used to create hydrogen, then looking at hydrogen and derivatives for transport, marine transport and marine shipping. But then using the balance of this material to grow and co-locate activities like marine, uh, uh, marine regenerative aquaculture. If you have a look at a off, lot of offshore assets, they have significant areas of biological diversity underneath them. And what we're hoping to do is try and uh, capture that and expand that by co-locating activities. And then looking at this as a development model for some smaller countries. We're currently doing a study in the Marshall Islands and the Republic of Palau um, on the numbers and running through those. And we're engaged with some work with the Malaysian government as well. And we'll be having a high level investor forum in Malaysia on the 7th of February next year to present the outcomes of this study. Um, the outcomes of this study obviously will be, what is the projected price for marine renewables? What is the projected price and benefit for co-locating these activities. So if you just look at it in terms of it's an energy project, they don't stack up. But if you look at it in terms of this an energy project with these development benefits and with these additional activities that governments can generate revenues from and they can create employment from, then it becomes a different story. So that is our general model. And I would invite you to just not write this off, but have a think about it. Um, it, may, it may influence some of your thinking. So. How we intend to scale this up is we've done the research already uh, and that will be presented sometime in, as I said, in, in February, 7th of February in KL. The important thing is for us to then take that research and drive that on through advanced market commitments. So what we're seeing is that we won't be competing with traditional large scale point to point supply chains. It'll just be complementing them because we won't be big enough. We won't be able to provide sufficient volumes, but there may be an opportunity for co-location and there may be an opportunity for to take part. So on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and I'll hand back to Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you for the presentation and yes. Yeah, and here's, I have one question for you. You mentioned an ecosystem. I think it's really interesting, but I think if there is a need to actually drive adoption, more players will be needed. So are there any roles that small and medium enterprises can play and can we expand it to the land? Yes, they are. And I think in terms of integrating, I'll go to the end of the question first. In, ter in, in terms of integrating from land to sea, it's very difficult when you're looking at literal or near shore enterprises to just look at them onshore, offshore. They they have they always have an onshore component. So in the for instance in Palau, we're looking at two projects at the moment which have been proposed to us. We haven't got approval on them yet, um, which look at taking existing assets that are on on land and then expanding them into sea to increase their capacity and increase energy generation. Now those assets, those activities will will be local businesses. 
So whilst the energy, large scale energy production will be an international multinational type uh, market, what we're seeing is the work that we're talking about in embedding those regenerative and environmental components to them will all, pretty much always be local businesses. And so there's an opportunity for local business funding. So for instance, the, the Development Bank of Palau would be a potential funding partner for some of those activities. So that's how we're, we're looking at it. Thanks, Cheryl. Well, thank you for taking your time and for the presentation. And well, thank you to our three general speakers today. We have a very scientific and practical understanding of the possibilities of hydrogen energy development in Southeast Asia. And well, finally is our panel discussion now. Well, thank you for your waiting and let's welcome our five panelists from MUFG, PLN, JERA, and Vena Energy, and Black and & Birch. Please turn on your video and audio so that our audience could see you now. Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, hello, hello good afternoon. guys. Hello, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Hi. Well, our panel will first start with an introduction. I will ask each panelist to introduce themselves, their name, company, and their take and ideas related to this topic. And also after your brief introduction, I hope all the panelists could answer me your simple general question. How you think the market for renewable energy project especially solar and wind in Southeast Asia, and which renewable source do you think will create more value in green hydrogen industry? Well, let's start with Ms. Ayako. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for inviting to this uh, very important and an interesting topic. I'm Ayako, I'm leading um, sustainable finance uh, strategy and then transaction side in the APAC. Um, we think um, green hydrogen is uh, one of the likely sustainable fuels uh, globally and also in Asia. Uh, however, in uh, structuring um, financial products, services, uh, there are some challenges. And then um, the financial industry is uh, developing uh, innovative products, uh, which I'm, ex uh, I'm looking forward to discussing later. Thank you. And how's your ideas regarding the question, the market for the renewable energy project and which one will play a more important role in green hydrogen? In, I mean, Asia is very broad, um, you know, advanced economy, including ASPAC, whereas ASEAN, I think still has um, lack of, you know, a sizable renewable power generation. So I think, um, in ASEAN, it's really important to have a um, reliable and then more structured uh, national policy in energy mix, including a renewable and also some support for scalable renewable projects, uh, including you know organic type, you know ammonia, um, uh, you know fuel, but also um, technical solution as well. Well, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Teku. Please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really uh, grateful to be here uh, and thanks uh, to be invited on this uh, discussion this, uh, this afternoon. And my name is Tegu Widiarsono. I'm serving as Executive Vice President of Corporate Finance uh, in PLN. Uh, if you might aware, PLN is the integrated utility company in Indonesia and we are the sole taker. We are serving 84.5 million customers, and then the size of install capacity is over 66 gigawatt. Then uh, PLN has strongly commitment in terms of energy transition and to have more clean energy and renewable uh, based sources with comprehensive uh, roadmap to meet our Indonesia 2030 national, sorry, nationally determined contribution and 2060 net zero carbon emission. Hopefully that today's discussion will provide us more insights. Dealing with the renewable energy development in uh, Southeast Asia, specifically in Indonesia, for the next 10 years, we will develop 21 gigawatt of renewable energy. And then majority by hydro, second one is geothermal, and then uh, solar panel, 
not included yet the rooftop solar panel. Uh, solar panel is around 4.7 gigawatt. And then uh, wind, including uh, wind is around 600 megawatt. And then biomass, yeah. The hydrogen market will be coming more important uh, given this is more uh, clean and also based on renewable energy will become more uh, attractive market uh, if this one is going to be commercialized. We already talk a lot with some manufacturers, including Jera and uh, some uh, partners in uh, global market. And this is really going to be the future uh, fuel for renewable energy. And this is going to be very, very attractive. And we, PLN and Indonesia, is widely open this idea and would like to welcome further cooperation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Teku. And you mentioned Jera. Then Sid, it's your turn. Thank you, Carol, and, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Siddhartha Basu, and I'm the strategy officer here at JIRA Asia. So as you may be aware, JIRA was founded back in 2015, and in 2019, fully merged the fuel and thermal power generation sectors of TEPCO and Chugo Electric. Uh, today, it's the largest power generation company in Japan, and also supplies around 30% of total electricity demand in Japan. So uh, having a very important responsibility in having stable electricity, but also at a reasonable price. Uh, we have a global portfolio of over 80 gigawatts power generation, um, including our positions in equity investments. And you know, I think a key part of our net zero 2050 emissions commitment relies on the utilization of ammonia and hydrogen. And to this end, we're in the process as referenced earlier in one of the keynotes, in, we're in the process of a demonstration of co-firing up to 20% uh, ammonia with our Hekinan thermal power station in Japan. And we are also in the process of separate co-firing activities with hydrogen in, taking place in the US. Additionally, we recently announced a plan for 100% ammonia fired power generation here in Singapore which will be, I think, a very important starting position to, to further expand the, um, the value chain for uh, ammonia here in the Southeast Asia region. So, uh, of course, renewables will play a very important role uh, in the development of these greener fuels and the value chains. And uh, I think it's, it's going to be a combination relying on each country's uh, resources when it comes to whether solar, wind, geothermal, offshore um, and how these can be leveraged in a way with the right level of infrastructure and development to also play a role in the expansion of this ecosystem. So uh, thank you and look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you. And uh, Mr. Gupta. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me for this panel. Uh, I represent uh, Veena Energy. My name is uh, Sunil Gupta. Veena is an Asia Pacific uh, renewable energy company. So we only produce and distribute uh, green electrons, all forms of wind, solar, storage, uh, and hybrid. Uh, currently, we have uh, more than 80 utility scale operating plants across 10 countries in Asia, Pac, where we operate um, with capacity of 4.5 gigawatts which is either operating or under construction, and, and another 60 gigawatts that is uh, under development over the uh, next few years. Uh, for us, uh, green hydrogen is a natural extension of what we are doing. Um, as I mentioned, our business has been uh, green electrons. Um, and if part of this energy transition goes from green electrons to green molecules, uh, that just comes naturally to us. And uh, since we are already producing uh, green electricity, it's just a natural extension. So very keenly looking at this market and uh, trying to figure out where and when the right opportunities open up. Look forward to a discussion on this panel. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Gupta. Then, well, Mr. Nasen, thank you for the waiting. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Shalil. Uh, really appreciate the invite here and being part of this panel discussion. Uh, my name is Narsing Chaudhary. I'm based in Singapore. I run the Black & Beach uh, operations uh, for Black & Beach in Asia Pacific. 
uh, been in the energy industry for almost now three decades. And I must say uh, the buzz around energy transition has never been higher than what it is today. And uh, I think some of the geopolitical issues which are there with Russia and Ukraine is really showing us that you know, we, we need to make that uh, step forward, uh, continuing to lean back on what legacy has been operating in various countries. It's not going to help the region. So, I mean, if you ask me uh, my bet on how I see Southeast Asia, I think Southeast Asia can become a leader or it can become a lagger for the whole thing. It depends on, uh, you know, I think the industry is willing to take a step, but there is some concrete steps required and support required from the governments in terms of policies and everything. Uh, in US, for instance, right now, uh, the, the overall uh, thrust towards getting more greener fuels or you know, both including green hydrogen or renewable energy in the system is so, so high. Uh, we are not seeing the same kind of, uh, I would say, push here in the region. Uh, of course, there is commitment to make it uh, uh, SEA has, for instance, asked for 24% uh, as part of the energy mix, but that's too small in my view. And uh, what more can we do in terms of hydrogen generation? Uh, we have recently uh, signed a 200 megawatt EPC contract for green hydrogen facility in US. And the same hydrogen which is getting generated gets fed into the gas network, which will be used for a power plant, which will eventually burn 30% blended hydrogen. Now, I mean, those kind of initiatives can definitely happen in here in the region. And if we see Southeast Asia, we are struggling with respect to having reliable uh, fuel source. Coal is expensive, super expensive today. It's no more the cheap, cheap coal that used to be two years back. And LNG is almost very hard for most countries who do not have their own uh, gas uh, development or have their own uh, uh, you know, gas sources. Uh, they're finding it very extremely hard to, uh, you know, lock in long-term LNG deals. So hydrogen definitely makes sense. Now, whether it's green hydrogen or gray hydrogen to start with, I think that's a different question. But, you know, transitioning towards more greener fuels, uh, SEA does not, or should not rather, output uh, be the last one to hop on, on the train, actually. The time is now. Well, thank you for the answer. Let's start the formal session. Well, Mr. Tegu, are you ready for the questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. You mentioned PRN has a very clear net zero strategies. It's very good to hear. And I also read from the news that Indonesia and PRN is currently conducting an assessment of the feasibility of hydrogen. Uh, maybe the result is not clear by now, but can you tell us briefly about the dimensions that will be taken into account and which factors actually man mattered when you do the decision? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, we just signed an uh, MOU with uh, some counterpart, yeah, especially Japanese counterpart, with some uh, big trading house in, yeah, uh, from uh, Japan. Then uh, to be... Uh, you know, tested in some of our power plants, this co-study uh, yeah, together with uh, some of our subsidiaries. And the size of it is around like, uh, we have, uh, we need to test around like one or two power plants. We are currently using coal. And now we uh, in the process of uh, doing the study with uh, some counterpart in order to have co wiring yeah, to replace the coal with the, uh, this hydrogen or ammonia. So this is quite interesting because uh, if this uh, study is successful, then it is uh, going to be commercialized uh, fully. And we believe uh, that uh, we met some uh, counterparts uh, back around uh, one month ago, and then uh, some of uh, study uh, said that in 2028 or 2029 this going uh, can be commercialized 100 percent so this is quite interesting because if we using this uh, as a testing now around 600 megawatt in some of our power plants uh, by subsidiary then uh, if this successful then we we, we now try like 20 percent and then uh, increase step by step to reach uh, the commercialized level uh, around 80 to 90%. So, but of course this takes time, you know, but in terms of size, 
uh, 600 megawatt is sizable enough, I think, to to achieve. Uh, uh, to I mean, to to be the, the lead example for for Indonesian case for Indonesia case. And then second, addressing your second question about uh, the the factors that should be considered. First, we need to think about the size of the market. Yeah. And second is dealing with the uh, who is the players, and then also the value chain of this uh, hydrogen or ammonia. Yeah. Last but not least is, of course, the uh, the consumer. Yeah. Or the you know the 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 target of the market. So this is quite important in order to boost the economical size of uh, hydrogen as the uh, new uh, renewable, uh, you know, uh, fuel in order to have uh, uh, green energy, but uh, need to be reliable, yeah, uh, affordable, and uh, also uh, need to be uh, available. Yeah. So this is something that, uh, in in our view, need to be addressed because uh, if the economic size can be reached, the players is uh, have. Uh, you know, uh, the competition is uh, available, and then the, the the value chain, yeah, including as well the target market, yeah, the user. Then this going to be uh, very very uh, successful. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, business and uh, of course better future as uh, new renewable sources for uh, in order to uh, electric. You know, uh, to be the 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 green energy sources uh, for. Uh, so it's easier, especially in Indonesia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And when do you think we will know the result of the evaluation? Can we get that during the G20 this year? Yeah, yeah, that's our expectation. Yeah, uh, because we, we already signed the MOU with, with the, the, some big uh, manufacturers. And then we expect uh, this to start uh, to be announced formally during the G20. And then the result usually like one uh, to two years. And given the successful, as mentioned by the the the, the previous speaker, that Indonesia is very aggressive uh, to using the biomass, yeah, to replace the coal, then this going to be interesting one. I mean, the hydrogen or ammonia, given the abundant uh, uh, ener renewable energy available in Indonesia, so we we can become one of such a big player when this uh, becoming uh, uh, successful to reach the commercial level. At current level, probably only 20 to 30 percent, but uh, we expect that by having more successful results, then it can be increased step by step. Thank you. Yeah. So how you actually position Indonesia's role in the whole market if your hydrogen activities are undertaken? Because we have other export markets or other competitors in the ASEAN. How do you think Indonesia mm. will play? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very good question. So uh, the good thing about Indonesia, yeah, the, our electricity tariff is still considerably very competitive. That's the first one, compared to any other uh, competitor, any other peers in, in Southeast Asia. That's the first one. Second, we have abundant renewable energy sources, especially uh, geothermal, yeah, hydro, and then solar, and then wind, and 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 biomass, and etc. And uh, the rest of it, yeah. Uh, given our long-term expansion planning. 10 years uh, expansion planning is planned, we need to have like 21 gigawatt. So if we install uh, this uh, renewable energy sources, then we have sufficient enough to produce the uh, this green hydrogen. Given 51% of our 10 years expansion planning coming from renewable, which means uh, 21 gigawatt. And then 50% from it is coming from hydro, which is considerably the most competitive energy available to produce hydrogen. Then uh, the rest of it is, uh, as I mentioned, 21 uh, gigawatt. Yeah, the rest of it uh, is coming from uh, gas, uh, both uh, combined cycle or open cycle. So we can say like uh, at least uh, another seven gigawatt should coming from gas, which also can produce yeah uh, the mo the one of the efficient uh, hydrogen and ammonia. Uh, so we can become such a big player uh, in the region, given the very competitive price and then abundant resources, including the plan to add more renewable energy into our 
into our energy mix. So there are a lot of lot of factors that should put in uh, in our consideration, uh, so we can become uh, the main player in the region. If this technology, I mean this uh, green uh, hydrogen, is really commercially uh, viable and becoming successful, result of the uh, that the study that now is uh, still uh, be done. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Tegu. Thank you for the generous sharing. And Sid, could you please introduce Jira's energy roadmap in developing in the Southeast Asia regarding the power generation? Sure. And, you know, I think to, to start, um, you know, Jira has, of course, projects focused uh, across the value chain. And, um, you know, we developed our, published our, our roadmap in Japan, which focused on how we can decarbonize the system, combination of not only retiring of certain assets, um, increasing our renewables, and also then the use of greener fuels. And I think we are also proactively working in the region here with the public and private sector to see how we can actually also support roadmap development. Because uh, we, we see a couple of things. First of all, that the, um, uh, the, the use of LNG and this is something that, of course, has come into question with volatility over the last year. But LNG plays a role. And the other part is that, especially with the greener fuels, the use of them in helping to not only decarbonize assets, but also, let's say, extend the life of certain assets in the region so that countries that are still in a development upswing can benefit from uh, you know, the assets and lower cost electricity right, for, for a longer period of time. So this is where we're working um, you know, in various countries, especially where we have partners. So in Bangladesh, we have been working in Indonesia. We have been talking with our partners in the Philippines, um, in Thailand, et cetera, to see how we can actually help shape this, how we can work with policymakers to ensure that the right frameworks and supportive policies are there to, to also support this transition. Um, you know, I think, as, as it was mentioned by uh, Mr. Lee earlier in his presentation today, clearly the region is expected to see increased demand uh, for baseload power and, of course, reliance on thermal is expected to increase um, due to challenges around early retirements. Um, and, and I think clearly the use of hydrogen and ammonia can be an important part uh, of this decarbonization puzzle. And um, you know, to, to this end, also it was mentioned that we had launched this uh, global tender for half a million tons per year of ammonia to support our own co-firing activities in Japan. But uh, this has really created waves in, in you know across the global value chain, and we think that the the story for usage of ammonia, for example, it, it needs to broaden outside of just Japan, and we need to see how we can support the additional demand for the region here in Southeast Asia to also utilize these greener fuels in power generation, uh, but also in, in the industry side. So when I mentioned uh, the power generation that we're looking at here in Singapore, for example, this will be combined with ammonia bunkering because the maritime sector uh, will also have great demand and is a very strong use case for the usage of ammonia. So I think, you know, there are various points that contribute to the roadmap, right? Clearly is the main part is how we can use for JIRA ammonia and hydrogen in our own power generation activities. But we are also actively looking to see how we can broaden this value chain, working with partners and policymakers as well to facilitate and expand this space. Okay, thank you. So regarding hydrogen, Gerald will define Southeast Asia more as a hydrogen production market as an export one or only defined as an offtake market? Uh, no, both, both. I mean, right now what we see is that uh, when you look in uh, you know, the Northeast Asian countries, so Korea, Japan clearly are looking at more of the importation side. Mm -hmm. And for that, uh, we're okay, looking across a variety of, of players to help meet our needs. But at the same time, um, what we see is there is great potential, as has also been alluded to in today's discussion, 
to for each of the countries here to take advantage of certain natural resources, whether they be around offshore wind, uh, solar, you know, the geothermal assets, uh, and also hydro potential. To um, you know, and as technology costs come down and infrastructure is put in place, this can be a very important part of not only meeting domestic needs, so for domestic decarbonization, but also uh, hopefully also expanding in the export market as well. Okay, thank you. Well, my last question is about green hydrogen's competitor. Well, as I mentioned before, one of the function of green hydrogen is to be a storage. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of hydrogen versus other storage like uh, batteries or hydro storage or others? Well, one, I mean, what we see, of course, there's many different options and te technologies that are being developed and looked at. And, and in the, um, you know, in the face of uncertainty, of course, diversification is, is often a good strategy. Specifically with, with hydrogen, uh, we, we are, of course, looking across the different vectors, right? The LOHC, uh, ammonia, as, as mentioned. And the, the one thing we see here is that there's the benefit of the, the flexibility, right, in terms of the transportation, uh, storage. Obviously, ammonia has well-established supply chains, given its use in fertilizers. Um, but but this is why you could say we're we're quite optimistic around the usage of these fuels. I mean, batteries, of course, will be used, and there are going to be use cases that make sense. But in the the power generation side, and especially as we look at the um, the quantities and the capacities required, this is where we feel there's an important role that uh, that both hydrogen and ammonia, for example, the, the, these will play in the power generation space. Um, but, you know, again, we're, we're looking across the batteries, as you mentioned, uh, that you know, the, these of course have specific use cases that we must take advantage of as well. Okay, thank you, Sid. Mr. Gupita, ready for your questions? Yeah. Well, okay, well, Ben, I as an integrated developer, you usually have many well, solar, wind, and hydrogen projects. Well, can you please describe what are the current obstacles to the promotion of green hydrogen projects? Sure. So um, the, the way we view it in the market is uh, it's very early days and uh, the end market for green hydrogen is limited and uh, it's only in certain pockets. If I were to talk about, um, let's say ASEAN and Southeast Asia, and you asked earlier whether uh, Southeast Asia would be a place to produce green hydrogen or would it be a place to consume green hydrogen or would it be somewhere in the supply chain in terms of uh, logistics? Um, in terms of, and you know, uh, Southeast Asia for that matter, Asia Pac is not a homogeneous market. Uh, each market has very different dynamic uh, in terms of demand, in terms of uh, its cost and competitiveness. But we do believe that uh, the green hydrogen would be a global market. It would not be a local market, just like how LNG and gas and, uh, and coal is, uh, there'll be some differences, but uh, there'll be a lot of elements, a uh, lot of global elements. Um, so when we talk about the production of green hydrogen um, in Southeast Asia, we struggle to see where Southeast Asia can be competitive uh, on a global basis in terms of manufacturing green hydrogen. As things stand right now, um, if we were to pick three or five of the best places in the world uh, to produce green hydrogen, be it from cost competitiveness, be it in terms of availability of infrastructure, be it in terms of uh, know-how, um, you know, there would be other regions which would uh, stack higher. Um, Chile and Latin America, some of the markets are uh, going to be very competitive. Um, 
some countries in the Middle East are going to be very competitive. Uh, within Asia Pac, um, you know, probably India uh, is very competitive. And, uh, and then there are certain other sort of, you know, virgin markets where we haven't had uh, much production of uh, green electricity because the end markets, the domestic end markets didn't exist. But if you're going to talk about export, you know, those could become production centers. And uh, I would uh, overlook Africa uh, with that perspective because uh, that's where you have a lot of the resource that can be used and uh, clearly they have a long way to go in terms of infrastructure, but, uh, uh, you know, there isn't much of a green hydrogen infrastructure anywhere in the world right now in scale. Um, and more specifically coming to Southeast Asia amongst all the countries, it's probably some combination of Vietnam and uh, Philippines, which, uh, which might, uh, which might be competitive, and maybe maybe I'll bring in Thailand. Um, and 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 the uh, and, and the reason would be uh, I'm assuming that uh, n- none of these countries right now have electrolyzer manufacturing or the balance of plant or you know the any of those uh, capabilities. All of that would be imported and likely it would be an electrolyzer. But uh, LCOE of uh, clean electricity would be a big differentiator. And the load factor in terms of what is the kind of diurnal uh, generation pattern in the PLS. And, um, and on that basis, uh, those would be some of the countries, but, uh, but they would stack behind some of the other countries that I mentioned. Now let's talk about the demand side of the equation. In terms of uh, demand side of the equation, uh, uh, of the Southeast Asian markets, um, other than Philippines and Singapore, other markets are very, very price sensitive. And uh, whether we talk about uh, the electricity markets, whether we talk about the transportation markets, uh, whether we talk about uh, some of the, uh, the fields that go in industry, be it oil, refining, steel, metal mining, you know, those are, those are very, very um, price competitive markets. So, and, and, and they have very uh, good other alternatives uh, for renewables. So, uh, you know, it, so, so it begs the question whether green hydrogen is really required in, uh, in some of those countries, because if it is, particularly if it is for electricity, I mean, and I'm gonna approximate a metric um, if you're going to use green hydrogen as a means to tide over intermittency or you know some sort of a storage medium, um, whether it's short duration or long duration storage, it is far too inefficient way of doing it versus just doing batteries. I mean, if one were to you know try to compute the round trip efficiencies of uh, lithium uh, batteries versus what it would be for the entire hydrogen infrastructure, even if it is you know, within the same country, the uh, efficiency losses, then first we produce hydrogen, then you've got to transport and store it, and then you've got to again uh, you know, burn it to produce electricity. I mean, by the time we put in all those losses, I mean, the round trip efficiency of going from a green electron to back to a green electron through hydrogen is, is very low. And uh, it, it would only make sense uh, in countries where you don't have an alternative green electron production within your own country or within the own grid, which uh, Southeast Asia, most of Southeast Asia has that. So, um, um, so, so that, that, that's an example for electricity. Again, when we take for the transport as an end market, I mean, uh, an EV, the, again, the efficiency of a battery versus you know, the fuel cell, uh, same argument. Uh, and the learning curve in the batteries is uh, still very steep. Um, that leaves us the industrial market, and that's where there will be a natural uh, in demand, uh, oil and gas, petrochemicals, refining. Uh, they already use, they are the biggest fertilizers. They are the largest uh, users of hydrogen. Right now they use gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, whatever you know, color they may be using. And uh, as they need to decarbonize, they could they could use green hydrogen, and and that's uh, that's probably where we will find uh, where we'll find end market. So 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 you know, very mixed bag. Uh, and I'll just finally come in and uh, in terms of electricity markets, 
uh, that leaves uh, Singapore and Philippines where the electricity tariffs, the costs are high because they import all the fuels and, uh, and you know, you know uh, the reasons for why the tariffs are high. And there could be some, you know, uh, some merit in uh, using the green hydrogen, uh, less so in Philippines, more so in Singapore. So that's what we see the, the roadmap, um, you know, at least for the next five years or so. Let me just stop here. I'm sure there'll be more views from other panelists. So you mentioned Singapore, Vietnam, and we also have Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand. They are all very major countries in this region. So could you please briefly evaluate their potential of implementation of green hydrogen? And actually, in which country will Venus next focus in developing these things? So uh, I presume uh, you're talking about uh, from a end demand consumption point of view, or, uh, or is your question about the production of green hydrogen amongst these countries? Well, it's a question about the difference, comparison of different countries and Venus idea of their potential for implementation of green hydrogen. And so, actually, I, what I want to know is what's Venus' idea and what's Venus' next step in this region? So which country were you being? So in terms of what Venus' strategy is, you'll find all of that on our website. So there is nothing more that uh, I can add because that's all uh, something that you know we disclose from time to time. Uh, in terms of where the opportunities might be, in terms of... Um, Excuse me, I'm about to start. In terms of, you know, um, the end markets, uh, clearly Singapore is ready uh, for green hydrogen. And, you know, the only way to decarbonize in Singapore because we don't have a production of uh, green electricity. We don't have land. We don't have wind. Um, we don't have any other than natural resources. So if Singapore has to decarbonize, uh, either you've got to import uh, electrons or you import uh, green molecules. So, uh, so you know, that, that fits in well, uh, depending on whenever it comes in, in terms of uh, the economic viability versus the other alternatives. Um, other countries, uh, only in the specific uh, industry segments, that's where we see an opportunity. In terms of large scale production of green hydrogen in Southeast Asia, um, perhaps Vietnam, uh, but uh, otherwise I think uh, we'll first get it out of other countries uh, before Southeast Asia becomes a big producer for export uh, rather than just for the domestic use of certain end markets. Okay, thank you for the sharing. Yeah. Mr. Nassi, I'm still there. Yes. Yeah, well, I assume you have already worked on several hydrogen or renewable projects. Well, which player do you think will play the main role in this transition to bring hydrogen in Southeast Asia? Yeah, I mean, uh, let me maybe take a step back with respect to, you know, what are the two biggest problems which is there with uh, large scale adoption of green hydrogen? One is cost, as soon as you just mentioned, uh, you know, cost is prohibitive. Uh, you know, even if you produce green hydrogen today, uh, you can't transport it because the logistic network does not uh, exist today uh, to be able to ship green hydrogen. Uh, you can convert it into ammonia. And of course, I mean, there are a lot of options that you can do with ammonia, including fertilizer production, uh, you know, even in, uh, using it as uh, energy, uh, you know, mixing it with coal or natural gas. Uh, but, you know, we are doing uh, work for a 300 megawatt green hydrogen facility in Vietnam. And it's a private developer who has stepped in uh, to build that actually. So we are conducting studies. The project looks viable. Uh, I, I believe the technology that exists today uh, is going to be similar to the solar story or the wind story where the scalability of those solutions with respect to efficiency and all those things will happen much faster. Today, the adoption of technology has just started on green hydrogen. And I think there is a lot of interest and a lot of uh, funds which is being poured in all over the world to develop it. So I'm optimistic. I'm a eternal optimist. I believe uh, the technology will evolve very quickly. Uh, who will take the lead? I think there is an opportunity for everybody. Uh, the slide which Stefan showed a couple of minutes earlier on the hydrogen ecosystem is, is very important. And it doesn't need to be you know, one player who does everything from the back end 
renewable to generating green hydrogen and being a consumer, uh, the industry could come together and somebody could be a consumer, somebody could be a you know, producer, and uh, some could be technology enablers. And like what we are trying to do, I mean, we are a technology enabler. We're working with various companies, including Mitsubishi and other OEMs on the development of their uh, gas turbine technology or electrolyzer manufacturers, couple of them in improving the efficiency of those electrolyzers and getting those projects implemented. So there's a role for everybody. Now, who will make the first move uh, uh, step? Uh, who are the believers and who will wait for things to become more solidified? This has to be seen, but there is an opportunity. Uh, another uh, aspect which needs to be seen is Southeast Asia by itself, no one individual country has the capacity to build the whole ecosystem. And there are some cross-border collaboration which might be required because there are countries like Cambodia and Laos who have a lot of uh, hydropower and you know, as Pak uh, Tegu was mentioning earlier, you know, it's one of the cheapest form of production of uh, uh, you know renewable power, and also uh, very reliable in terms of you know several months during the year. Can they be used during off-peak and peak hours? And you know, so there's a lot of things which could be done. I think the buzz has started, and uh, I'm optimistic that things will move very fast from where we are today. Well, thank you for the answer. And I think many uh, guests mentioned uh, the demand of the market. So how do you evaluate the buyer markets in this region? Are there enough buyer where, well, handle the demand of the hydrogen or ammonia? So ammonia, of course, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, demand which is there. Question is, at what price would they get this? I mean, we, are we talking of uh, green hydrogen? Then it's fairly expensive as compared to, you know, ammonia, which can be generated by the traditional model. On green hydrogen, one of the biggest challenge uh, which I see today is the logistic network does not exist. I mean, there are uh, companies who would like to have a blend of hydrogen because they have decarbonization goals. Uh, particularly, take the technology companies. If you look at uh, all the technology companies which are there, whether it's Amazon or Microsoft or Google, they will all announce that they would like to have net zero, uh, you know, achieve much faster than the rest of the industry. Now they cannot achieve it by using the rotation source. So they're willing to uh, invest into it and they're, they're willing to be an immediate consumer. The problem for the industry is we don't have the technology yet for shipping green hydrogen. We can do it through ammonia, but of course, I mean, then the cost becomes higher. So uh, I believe if the industry is able to figure it out, how do we transport, uh, transport this without too much of efficiency loss, there is enough demand in the world market today. And more so because if you look at the LNG or gas prices today, it's phenomenally very high. It's very unpredictable today. And uh, you know there are pockets which could be used for distributed generation of green hydrogen and also self-consumption in many parts of Southeast Asia. Well, since Black and Beach is a consulting company, so if now you have a well a customer from ASEAN and he want to do something related to green hydrogen or conduct several hydrogen projects, could you provide some insights or advice to him? Yeah, we, as I said, we are already working with one in Vietnam. It's a 300 megawatt green hydrogen facility. And I can't speak much because we are bound by NDAs, uh, so that we can't reveal much, but it's a very, uh, I would say, uh, very project which initially looked very difficult to implement, but as we are going into the details and working out on the options which could be exercised to make it, uh, you know, uh, from a production perspective viable, I think it looks good. Uh, they're talking to the government, to the industry with respect to what could be used for the hydrogen locally and if there is a possibility of shipping the hydrogen in whatever form it can be shipped. Uh, to Japan, Korea, or Singapore. So and they're in discussion with several other consumers around the world. So uh, we're having some similar discussions with certain players in Thailand. But again, they are very, at a very early stage. I believe maybe in the next year or so, while some of those uh, projects in Australia, in US, uh, they start taking shape, people will start to have more confidence and uh, you know believe that there's something that uh, they could step on and of course, I mean, the risk is there with respect to the technology development when you step in early efficiency and all those things, not really at the scale where it is, but, you know, somebody has to bite into it. And the early adopters, of course, will be rewarded by the, uh, you know, by the market and by the shareholders. 
Well, you are really confident with the market. We hope the situation will come true very soon. Well, thank you for that. Then I have some. Hi, Cheryl. Yeah, hi. Thank you for the waiting. And I hope you, in the end, could provide us some finance perspective. So my first question for you is, what are key risks in considering approving green hydrogen projects and how are they mitigated to enhance the bank ability and scale? Sure. Um, well, the first of all, MUFG uh, is strongly committed to um, the scale up of renewable and then clean technology, including hydrogen. And uh, as a corporate banking, uh, globally, we committed to uh, provide a sustainable finance at um, 35 uh, trillion yen uh, by uh, 2030. And then uh, we are uh, one of the Japanese banks. And then we are supporting our clients globally, but with some focus aligning with um, Japanese uh, business policy. And then um, the Japanese government has uh, announced the first uh, comprehensive uh, hydro economy plan um, among all the you know, global nations. And uh, we are um, promoting both two different layers. The first is market making. I think lots of you know, panelists and then um, speakers in the beginning, uh, we are all working to um, help um, enhance um, from the R&D research development into um, scalable utility you know, level, a uh, commercially competitive uh, market. And we are the one of founder of a Japanese hydrogen forum and uh, supporting uh, mostly in application in the US hydro station, uh, hydro business, but also in Asia, we are part of CCUS network. And uh, also we are helping to define Asia transition uh, finance um, uh, uh, metrics through Asian Transition Finance Study Group, which MUFG is a lead. And um, that involves the banks, uh, development banks, and uh, a couple of um, developers. And then um, later this month, September 26, uh, one of the report is uh, coming so that we help um, standardizing, you know, sustainable uh, banking uh, in the region, uh, in Asia. Then um, also transaction wise, uh, we see uh, so many um, uh, um, uh, inquiries from clients, uh, but also, as you have mentioned, uh, we are aware of uh, some uh, risks and then opportunity uh, from uh, bankability. And then it's probably more a business side. We see um, uh, needs uh, proper uh, subsidies. Uh, in the region. Um, in Australia, Japan, uh, there is um, uh, more than $1 billion um, subsidy, uh, subsidy, but uh, much, much less in even some of advanced economies like Korea and then emerging economies, uh, Korea, China, and India, Indonesia. And then CO2 price wise, um, of course, you know, globally, there have been efforts. And then recently in EU, there have been a bit of an uh, increase but still, you know, in Asia, it needs to rise. Another point is revenue support um, that we don't really see um, uh, systematic uh, efforts uh, in the policies in the region, whereas uh, Europe, for instance, there is a contract for difference supporting uh, revenue payment side. And then uh, Germany is installing carbon border adjustment measure. Um, I think, you know, Asia still needs to study and then uh, work on that, you know, uh, to fill the gap. Of course, you know, those need to go to um, help in large scale investment and, uh, uh, you know, the cost reduction efforts that we start seeing in the region. The next part is bankability. We see three <laughs> risks and an opportunity um, to approve uh, green hydrogen uh, projects um, in ASEAN. Uh, our project revenue, I think off taking, uh, we need to have a pool of credit worthy off take. And then uh, we see some kind of bilateral, but it needs to have more standardized uh, framework. Uh, and then we should see more um, you know, precedence and market benchmarking. 
then uh, we have seen off-taking, you know, e equity involvement in off-taking. However, um, it has to be less typical. Then the next part of bankability is regulation. Um, still, you know, internationally, there does, doesn't seem to have uh, um, coordinated uh, regulation. And then, you know, technology side, uh, we would like to see electrosis uh, at utility scale. It's still, you know, novel. And then um, st stranded asset, uh, stranded asset risk. Um, we would see, you know, licensing for uh, electros electrosis, uh, ammonia production. Uh, one of the key um, uh, elements to see um, um, the. You know, certainty over the um, uh, long term in terms of you know energy um, sectors um, uh, stable uh, you know business going. Then third point is liquidity. Um, fortunately, we see um, strong appetite uh, of sustainable finance uh, among some investors, and then uh, green certification potentially allows um, a wider pools of funding. Um, so those are a couple of uh, key risks um, that we need to consider in um, uh, structuring um, uh, hydrogen related uh, business. Well, okay, thank you. Um, we mentioned many countries today, and I assume you are already an expert of sustainable finance. So where are you already funding green hydrogen project? How is the pipeline and the outlook of this project? Yes, uh, we are a multinational, I mean, a global bank, and then we have been pretty active both in uh, advanced and also, you know, emerging markets, including ASEAN. Um, advanced economy uh, in the US, for instance, uh, we, uh, we have a um, couple of um, uh, participation uh, in uh, funding um, uh, the, the hydropower station uh, company. And uh, also um, we see um, uh, quite strong uh, pipeline uh, in um, ASEAN. Um, we, we can't really disclose so much, you know, um, uh, particular names and then the size, but uh, we actually are working with uh, manufacturers uh, trade finance, uh, energy uh, uh, companies, uh, also, you know, a lot of, you know, state-owned um, entity that we see typically in ASEAN and from, you know, both uh, production side, uh, use, and then, you know, transportation case. We would, um, from sustainable finance point of view, uh, it's very interesting because our policy is developing uh, in the EU, for instance, uh, some specification uh, like 73.4% of our GHG reduction is um, proven. Uh, EU acknowledged this is you know, green hydrogen and then it is valid uh, under EU sustainable taxonomy. And then green bond insurance is uh, something you know, new. And then we think it's quite a smart way um, scaling up um, hydrogen green hydrogen uh, through sustainable finance, because we see, um, uh, you know, off-taking has been one of the, you know, challenges, but green bond uh, uniquely doesn't link uh, off-take uh, revenue. So it's a good start. And then, you know, US, a uh, couple of, um, uh, you know, precedents, and then uh, Air Liquid issued uh, about uh, 500 million pounds uh, with, you know, 10 year green euro midterm. And that was, you know, quite uh, well subscribed. And then another e, uh, European entity, Copenhagen Infra Partner, they raised fund about uh, Euro 3 billion for hydro transition or harder to abase, uh, abate sector. In Asia, uh, again, um, you know, Temasek, um, you know, invest in a very interesting catalytic fund and then carbon negative technology um, aligning uh, climate align, uh, climate including hydrogen. Um, and then another example is uh, Mitsubishi uh, Heavy Industry. Um, and they have a various technology solution. And then they have issued a decarbonization transition bond uh, of $100 million, five-year tenor, 0.31% uh, um, of a coupon. 
uh, including gas turbine and then hydro production, CO2 uh, capture. So um, there are early um, you know, issuance of a green or sustainable finance. And then we, I think, are encouraged that um, some standardization of um, uh, greenness or certification of a greenness of a green hydro uh, has been happening uh, to take example climate um, bond initiative, which is one of the uh, standard setters uh, in um, uh, ensuring the greenness of certain uh, ESG labeled finance, um, has released a draft hydrogen guidance um, uh, last week. And then now um, they put on public comment um, by end of October, and then that has uh, a provision of, uh, you know, renewable, it has to come from grid to renewable, like wind, solar, hydrogen, uh, geothermal, and it has to be new additional renewable because it doesn't stress uh, the basic, you know, um, uh, power uh, consumption um, demand. And the mitigation side, uh, you know, has to be a 90% uh, of uh, capture through CCA, and then um, upstream methane leakage, you know, must be less than 0.2%. And the carbon intensity uh, was, you know, uh, proposed from three kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilogram uh, H2 uh, by 22, and then pretty much almost like a zero. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, disclosure compliance, and then, uh, and then it has to have um, from you know corporate that has um, ambitious um, um, carbon um, energy transition uh, framework. So all and all, uh, we see very strong um, uh, industry efforts um, that support um, companies uh, who are participating into um, this green hydrogen business globally and also in Asia as well. And we are um, continuing to support um, the business in the region uh, with our uh, global uh, capability, but a solution uh, in a, a locally, you know, um, uh, tailor-made way. Uh, thank you for the answering and thank you for MUFG's support to the sustainable uh, finance. Well, time flies and I have one Conclusion question to all the panelists. Could you please estimate the timeline of green hydrogen projects in Southeast Asia when it will be commercial and when scale up? Who wants to be the first to answer it? Then sit. Question. Um, and I think what, what we see is there are certain industries, as mentioned before, certain tech companies, for example, that will have pressure to show either that they're um, greening their portfolio or their operations, or in other cases, there'll be uh, governments that are more proactive in trying to set certain uh, targets. And, and so I think this will be a key driver, but um, you know, I, th I think there's gonna be, there needs to be some way to support the, an offset or provide subsidies for the costs, right, to, to support this. Um, you know, I think at the earliest we'll see this coming in the next few years, but this will be in unique cases. Uh, otherwise, it, it's going to be looking a little further along towards 2030. But um, I think optimistically, if some of the initial projects, like the one I mentioned, we're doing here in Singapore, if these can move ahead, this will be a good template at least in the power generation space and that, that we can look to then scale from. Uh, the, Mr. Tegu, any ideas? Yeah, uh, based on our discussion, uh, of course, this really depends on the, you know, the technology advancement and also research space, yeah. But uh, on our discussion with some, uh, uh, you know, a college from, from our counterparts, uh, there is a, a possibility to speeding up, yeah, uh, around 2027, 2028, to be like uh, more commercially, uh, like uh, above 70%, yeah. Currently, it's still like 20%, yeah. But uh, of course, uh, it takes time 
However, the commitment of all parties to be collaborate uh, together and technology investment will uh, boost the commercialization of uh, this uh, green hydrogen. And I do believe that uh, given the volatility of primary energy prices, the energy crisis in, in some areas in the world really push us to be more uh, committed for the technology development. So there's uh, no wonder that uh, this becoming more interesting uh, uh, one to see, yeah, whether this one can be uh, fully commercialized by 2028, uh, then of course this will bring more benefit, not only uh, for the people in Southeast Asia, in Asia, but also uh, around the world, because we can have very efficient, you know, uh, energy sources and the most important one is renewable uh, energy base. So uh, that's uh, basically, uh, you know, the, the things that we are also expecting. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Nasai, please give me two number, one commercial and one scale up. Mr. Nasai, are you still here? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, look, going commercial uh, is going to be difficult because the technology is still not there. Uh, I was in the guest conference in Milan last week, and uh, I can tell you, I mean, uh, we talked to some electrolyzer manufacturers who had also come in. They have a couple of gigawatts of capacity being built, and the capacity is all being taken up. So there are a lot of people who are interested, but most of them, uh, for sure, were not from Southeast Asia. I, I feel three to five years would be a time where it will go for hydrogen production, but it may not be green hydrogen because I mean the overall ecosystem for green hydrogen, having sufficient renewable energy in Southeast Asia is not there. So some countries may have edge there, but it might start with gray hydrogen or using excess power, which might be there during when the renewable energy is not available. So you produce hydrogen when green power is available and uh, during uh, when the green energy is not available, you use the uh, alternative sources of power which are available. And you produce green, I mean, hydrogen, sometimes green, sometimes gray, but there's a market for both. And as uh, Aitosan was mentioning, uh, it is some kind of certification bodies are working on it that they could certify what is produced as green hydrogen during certain part of the day and what is produced as gray hydrogen. And probably there is a commercial market for both. And Mr. Gupta, I agree with them. I would agree with uh, what uh, I heard from uh, Siddharth and uh, Dr. Gu. Uh, probably five to eight years. I would be very pleased if we see a scaled deployment of, and I'm talking about green hydrogen, um, scaled deployment of green hydrogen in less than five years. Um, but uh, never under, underestimate the learning curve and the ingenuity of human mind. So uh, I'm very pleased if it's faster. Well, okay, thank you for the answer. And also thank you very much for today's discussion. So perspective were indeed very rich and the content are very enlightening. I hereby appreciate all of our guest speakers for coming and contributing to this topic today. I hope all of you will gain new ideas and experience from today's webinar, just as I have. And if you like to discuss, hmm, if you'd like to discuss further topics related to renewable energy industry in Southeast Asia, we welcome you come to in um, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam in October and Manila, Philippines in November. Thank you very much for your company today and I hope you all the best and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for Have a nice day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you.